welcome to today's webinar, Convex Optimization for Finance. Um, as always, this webinar will be recorded and posted to our YouTube channel uh, within the next few days, so look out for an email with the um, recording link. Today's speaker is Scott Sanderson. Scott is a senior software engineer at Quantopian, where he's responsible for the design and implementation of Quantopian's backtesting and research APIs. Outside of work, Scott is a contributor to several open source projects in the Python data science ecosystem, and he is a regular conference speaker on topics in numerical programming. Thanks, Scott. Thank you. Um, hey, everybody. Uh, thanks for tuning into this talk. Um, so the title of this talk is Convex Optimization for Finance. Uh, right, so I want to talk a little bit before we get started with the talk about sort of what the goals are for this talk and what I, I want to introduce in this material. Um, so uh, one of the, the first goal is I want to sort of situate convex optimization within the broader landscape of optimization techniques in general, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more later about what that means. Um, and in particular, one of the goals that I have is to help you sort of build a geometric intuition for convex functions and convex sets and understanding sort of why it is the case that uh, convexity is a useful property for optimization. Um, once we've done that, I want to actually show some uh, applications of convex optimization to finance. So in particular, we're going to look at some applications to portfolio construction and portfolio optimization. Um, and then finally, I want to sort of give you some, some resources to further study. So optimization and even convex optimization are, are big topics that you know, we could teach an entire course on. In fact, people have taught entire courses on. Um, so my goal here today necessarily isn't necessarily to make you, you know, total experts at optimization, but to give you sort of enough understanding that you can follow up yourselves and sort of learn more material that's interesting to you. Um, cool. So the outline sort of in service of those goals is we're going to talk first about optimization in general, sort of what, what, what it means to be solving optimization problems. Um, then we're going to talk about convex optimization in particular and why convexity is this interesting property for optimization. Um, and then finally, we're going to talk about applications of convex optimization to the financial domain. Um, so first up is optimization. Um, so in general, mathematical optimization is uh, this family of techniques for whenever we're interested in finding sort of the best value for some set of choices. So this comes up all the time in, in finance or in uh, you know, operations research or any, any time where you're interested in this mathematical problem of I've got a set of possible choices and I want to find the best possible choice among those set of choices. And best means different things in different contexts, but we have sort of this general family of tools for trying to find good values among some set of choices. Um, so to phrase that a little bit more rigorously, uh, we usually sort of phrase an optimization problem in two parts. Um, so the first is we have some set S of possible choices that we're trying to optimize over. Um, we often call this like the optimization domain or just our, our domain. Um, and then we have a scalar valued objective function defined on S that we're trying to minimize or maximize. So you can sort of think of this depending on your domain, you can think of this in different ways. So if we're trying to minimize our objective function, you might think of this as like a loss or a cost function. So for every point in the set S that we're optimizing over, we have some cost associated with that. And what our optimization is doing is trying to find the point that has the minimum cost. Um, or in sort of more economic applications, we also, we're often sort of maximizing functions. And then you can think of our objective function as something like a utility function. So for example, if we're trying to choose a portfolio, we might choose our utility function to be uh, optimizing our expected return or maybe some risk adjusted expected return. Um, so these are the only two things that we really need uh, to have a well-posed well uh, mathematical optimization problem. Um, but often in particular domains, it's convenient to add sort of a third component, um, which is a set of constraints on valid elements of S. So, uh, you know, we might have some set S, say, of all possible portfolios, but in reality, we can't choose any possible portfolio because we only have a limited amount of capital or say we're, you know, we're long only or uh, we have sort of constraints on how much of our portfolio we can we can put into particular assets or particular sectors of the economy. Um, and we could express those just in terms of our set of possible choices, but it's often natural to phrase a problem in, to, in terms of kind of an ambient set of choices, an objective function, and then this third component, which is a set of constraints on the elements that we actually want to consider valid. Um, so mathematically, this is the notation that we use to talk about optimizations functions. So we say uh, we want to maximize over uh, the elements x drawn from our set x, oops, um, the function f of x. And then we said we want to maximize that subject to a set of constraints 
uh, C sub i of x, where C sub i are going to be functions that take a point and return zero if the point is sort of satisfies the constraint or doesn't satisfy the constraint and return one if the, if the function satisfies the constraint. So the way to sort of read this in plain English is we want to say we want to find the value of x in s that maximizes our function f while satisfying all the constraints. Um, so to take some examples of this. Um, so here we're going to uh, look at a function called the Rosenbrock function, which is sort of a classic example actually of a function that's hard to optimize. And we'll talk a little bit more about why that might be the case in a bit. Um, so here I'm using uh, a tool called IPy volume to actually render a, uh, a 3D graph of what this function looks like. Um, and you can see that this function has this kind of interesting curvature where we're sort of curving up around the ends over here. And then we have this kind of like valley running through here and that that value is actually kind of at an angle. So it's tilted slightly to the right and then running, uh, running down. And the colors here also sort of show us uh, the height. So we can see that the minimum of this function sort of trickles down through the left side and eventually ends up somewhere in this right side here. And in fact, uh, in the configuration I have for this function, the minimum is going to be at 1, 1, which is sort of somewhere in this purple region here. Um, so this is our function that we're trying, we might be interested in uh, minimizing or maximizing. Um, so one very general tool that we, we might use to try to minimize this function uh, comes from scipy, which is scipy.optimize.minimize. Um, and minimize has kind of this interesting signature actually, where minimize is a single function interface to a large number of different solvers. So here I'm saying minimize, uh, I'm passing a couple things. So I'm passing a function to use that's describing the, the function that I'm actually trying to optimize. Um, and for this interface, at least the way that this works is I have to give uh, scipy a function that can evaluate what I'm trying to minimize at a single point. So here I'm passing a function that will just evaluate the Rosenbrock function at the point that uh, minimize asked me for. Um, I have to give it an initial starting point. So the method that we're using here is essentially going to sort of try to evaluate different points and then move around and try to figure out where the minimum of the function is. Um, and then finally, I have to pass it this method string that tells it what optimization method to actually use. And there's a whole bunch of different methods. Um, and this is a relatively simple method called Nelder Mead that doesn't require any additional information from me. There are other methods that you might want to use that require me to pass additional information. So for example, some methods might require things like functions to compute gradients at a particular point in time or uh, the Hessian matrix, which is sort of an n-dimensional generalization of uh, the second derivative. Um, so if I ask minimize to minimize this function, then it returns to me this, this sort of complex object that describes uh, what happened in the optimization. So it tells me the value of the function at the minimum. Uh, it gives me a message that tells me that this optimization succeeded. Um, it tells me how many times it had to evaluate my function. So here it's saying, in order to find a reasonable minimum of this function, I had to evaluate this Rosenbrock function 141 times. Um, and that was over 72 iterations. So it might do multiple iterations and some of those might require more than one evaluations. Um, saying again that we succeeded successfully. And then finally, it's telling us what is the actual minimum that it found. And we can see that it found a value that was quite close to the, the correct minimum, which is uh, you know, one, one. So within more or less rounding error here, uh, minimize successfully found the minimum of this function. Um, so that's, that's nice. You know, that, that gives us some intuition for how this might work. But uh, one thing that might be interesting for us to try to understand a little bit more about how this particular optimization method works is to understand what were all the points that it had to uh, ask us to evaluate in order to figure out the minimum of this function. So in order to do that, we can pass a slightly more complex function that's going to just keep track of the points that SciPy asked us for. So here, instead of passing just the Rosenbrock function, we're passing this, uh, we're calling this minimize traced function. And all this is going to do is make a list and then create a function that uh, first that takes a point and appends that point to the list and then returns the original function that we're interested in, which in this case is going to be that Rosenbrock function. Um, and then we're going to call minimize not with the Rosenbrock function, but with this wrapper traced function that records all the points that we're interested in. Um, and so what's going to happen here is now when I call minimize trace, we're still going to evaluate uh, and find all those points, but now we're going to get back uh, a list of all the values that SciPy asked us to evaluate when it did this optimization. Um, and so if I run this, we can see that it again starts at the point that we gave it, which is negative one, one. Um, and then it initially kind of starts exploring in different directions, right? So we move a little bit in the uh, X direction, and then we move a little bit in the Y direction, and then we move a little bit um, in both of those directions. And then as it goes, it sort of makes more complex choices that are a little hard to, harder to reason about. Um, and so one way that we can try to understand this is to actually visualize this trace. So 
Um, here's a slightly more complex visualization function that's going to do uh, the same thing that we did before to draw it, but it's also going to uh, record that trace and add the trace points uh, at different points in the surface. So if I uh, build this little widget now, um, I can actually see for a particular starting configuration and a particular method, what points SciPy asked us to evaluate. So we can see we started up on the left where the darker points are and they sort of gradually transition to these lighter points. So we're going to start kind of up on the top left corner of this and we can see now a little bit more clearly that what uh, this method is doing is kind of following uh, the curvature of this surface down along this path and then it eventually runs up into this ridge and realize okay we're, we're kind of going in the wrong direction here now um, and then it will start sort of trickling back down into this valley it goes a little bit of a distance there before it eventually realizes that you know we're, we're again not making progress and finally it sort of makes its way back into the area where the minimum actually is and we can see that this behaves a little bit differently depending on where we start the points so for example if we start over here now we start on this hill we can come down, we trickle down, we, we get to where we want to go a little bit more efficiently. Um, and we can play around with this a little bit to kind of get a sense of how this optimization algorithm behaves for different kinds of inputs. So for example, here we're starting way up on the corner now and we kind of go up to the right and we go back and forth. Um, so one of the things that's interesting about this function is it actually gets very, very tall very quickly as we get away from this deli, which is part of, the, part of what makes this function hard to optimize. Um, one of the things that's especially interesting about this is we can actually look at how different methods might try to uh, optimize this function. So we've seen examples of how this uh, Nelder Mead function behaves, but we could switch to a different method like Powell. Um, and now we can see a, a pretty different exploration pattern here, right? Where now we've kind of got this like grid search behavior going on. Um, and again, we can try that for, for different inputs or different uh, spaces and sort of see, see different behaviors as we go. Oops. This is, there we go. This is, this is a little better example. So now, again, we can see this one's much more sort of spread out and much more diffuse and it's trying uh, a bigger pattern in different directions. Um, and for different kinds of functions, one of these methods might work better or others. Um, so like I said, scipy.optimize is, is a little bit interesting in that it sort of packs its interface into all these different solvers into one single function. Um, and so one, one tool, one thing that can be challenging about that is that it's hard to know how to use the function because it's really like eight different functions all sort of duct taped together in one, into one thing. Um, and so one function that's useful for trying to understand better how to use minimize is this show options function. Um, and this just tells you a little bit about all these different uh, minimization algorithms. So for example, uh, we've got, there we go, okay. We've got BFGS and dog leg and LBFGSB, which is super clear, I'm sure to everyone. Um, and you can see that this, this goes on for quite a while. So there's all, all kinds of different uh, ways that you might try to optimize functions. And depending on how much information you know ahead of time about your function or how much information you can provide, uh, you might, different optimization algorithms here might uh, produce different results. Or might uh, say, produce better results or produce results more quickly. Um, so that's, that's sort of general purpose optimization, right? This is an idea that we have some function that we're trying to uh, optimize and you know, we can try various different techniques based on how much we know about that function's behavior to try to find local minima or local maxima. Um, but that doesn't always work all that well for us. And some of the algorithms that I showed you, for example, uh, while they work nicely for this sort of simple two-dimensional case, uh, they can start to run really, really slowly or not necessarily even converge at all um, as we either throw them at more complicated functions or we throw them at functions that operate in multiple dimensions. Um, and so that sort of motivates this next question of are there other places where we can uh, sort of restrict our domain to do to do a little do work a little bit more efficiently. Um, and so the, the general idea here right, is general purpose optimization is, is really, really hard. Um, it's actually it's provably impossible in the totally general case. So if we know absolutely nothing about the function that we're uh, trying to optimize over. You know, if you imagine that our function was just given an input, choose a random output in our output space, then really all that we can do is sort of guess and check like every possible floating point value. And there's no way that we can do that in any reasonable amount of time. Um, under somewhat modest assumptions, we can guarantee that algorithms will converge to the correct result, um, but they might take sort of an arbitrarily long amount of time to do that. If we have a very complex input space, um, or if we have a very sort of complex function, then for many of these algorithms, there's no hard guarantees that they will give us back a correct result in any reasonable amount of time. Um, there's a couple reasons why, that, why that's the case. So one is that 
um, as we start searching in larger dimensions. So in, in the Rosenbrock case that I was just showing, we were searching in two dimensional space, right? So anywhere in the X, Y plane corresponded to a point on our surface. And that meant that, you know, the, the number of points that we were interested in uh, was relatively small um, in sort of a, a global sense. But as we add sort of more and more dimensions, the set of the space of points that we're interested in for a given region sort of grows exponentially in, the, in that dimensionality. And so that can make it very, very hard for us to search that space effectively if we don't know anything else about the function. Um, another problem we can run into is that for some functions, we can have the problem of local minima or local maxima. So you might imagine uh, somewhere in the function, there's a point that's the minimum for everything around it locally, and there's sort of like a big basin around that point. And then somewhere else far away in the function, there's actually a, a, another sort of bigger basin with a, a lower point. Um, and for many of these algorithms that are sort of searching around locally and trying to follow the curvature of the, of the surface that we're exploring, um, they can get sort of trapped in these local minima or in, or in these saddle points. And a lot of uh, research in say machine learning or in optimization uh, is about sort of how to, how to define or how to produce heuristic algorithms that uh, can successfully escape those things or, or that can sort of mitigate that challenge. Um, and then that, that problem can be particularly challenging if uh, we have interesting constraints on our input space. So if you recall back to our original definitions, we had our objective function and our input space, and then we had the set of constraints. Um, and if those constraints are very narrow or sort of result in an oddly shaped feasible region, it can be hard for many optimization algorithms to uh, handle that. And many optimization algorithms can't necessarily handle those constraints. Um, and so, as is often the case in computer science or in programming, um, when we find ourselves with a really hard problem that we don't know how to solve, we can often do much better if we can sort of restrict our problem to only care about particular easier cases. So in this case, if we know that our objective function and our constraints are well behaved in some sense, then we can often do much better than we can in the general purpose optimization case. Um, and so in particular, an important class of well-behaved functions are convex functions and sort of associated with them are convex constraints. So what I, what I want to talk to you about sort of in the next few minutes is uh, what, what that means and why those functions might be useful uh, for optimization. Um, so here's sort of the mathematical definition of a convex function. So uh, if you look at this, you might sort of squint and like kind of get a little scared of this because it's kind of a complex looking equation here. Um, but if you spend a little bit more time looking at this, I think it's actually not too bad. Um, and the important thing to notice here is that on both sides of this equation, we have this, we have expression that looks like x0 times t and then x1 times 1 minus t. And in one case, it's inside the f. And in one case, we have sort of that same structure, but it's uh, outside the f. Um, and so the idea here, right, is that we're interested in a, a function evaluated on points between two or two points that that define a line in the input space, which is our x0 and our x1. And when we say uh, x0 t plus x1 1 minus t, what you should mentally sort of substitute in your head there is all the points on the line between x, x0 and x1. Um, so what this is really saying is that uh, if we evaluate f on sort of a, a point along in the interval between x0 and x1, then it ends up less than this expression. Um, and what that expression ends up being is uh, essentially the, the line uh, t percent of the way, or the, the point t percent of the way along the line between the outputs. So that's still a little bit abstract. So I, the best way that I sort of know to understand this is actually just look at a picture of what this uh, does. Oops, there we go. Um, so here's sort of an example of a convex function. Um, and so here I'm drawing essentially the left-hand side of that equation and the right-hand side of that equation um, so that we can understand what it says. So the left-hand side of that equation is this blue line. And what this blue line is, is our function f evaluated at all the points between uh, x0 and x1, where x0 is negative 2 and x1 is 2. So we're essentially just parameterizing our curve um, on all the points between this interval and x. Um, and then what this red line is, is just all the points on the line directly between f of x0 and f of x1. And what we can see for this function um, is that the blue curve always falls below the red, red dotted line. And that's really all that that previous definition is saying, um, is that if we take any two points uh, in our input space and look at the line that falls directly between uh, f evaluated at those points, then the function will always sort of fall below that line. 
So this is what a convex function looks like. So to take an example of a non-convex function, so here's an example of a function that doesn't have that property, where now as we evaluate f, there's points where it goes above the line, and then at some point it crosses and goes below that line. And so we can think about this in terms of the sort of shape or the, the direction of curvature of this function is changing over time. And that's sort of the hallmark of being a non-convex function. And that might start to give you some intuition for why non-convex functions might be harder for us to optimize because they have sort of more complex curvature to them. Um, so to come back to this definition now again, um, we, can, we can sort of summarize that by saying, uh, what this inequality is saying is that the left-hand side is F applied to the point, essentially T percent of the way between X0 and X1, or T is ranging from zero to one. So we're saying for any point, sort of N percent of the way between our, our boundaries, then that's gonna be less than or equal to the point t percent of the way along the line between f evaluated at those points. Um, and that's sort of, that's the mathematical intuition and the geometric intuition you wanna have again is that if we take any two points on our curve and draw a line between them, then the curve always falls below that line. Um, so, so that's how convexity works in the uh, one dimensional case. Um, but it turns out this definition actually generalizes naturally to arbitrary dimensions. So previously we were thinking of X0 and X1 as being say, points in, uh, in just R on the real line, um, but the exact same inequality actually works just as well for points in Rn, so the sort of n-dimensional space of, of vectors. So now instead of thinking of X as uh, just a single point along the line, we should think of X as like a, a vector of, of points with n elements in it. Um, and so if we draw this now, one way to think about this might be that uh, our, if we draw sort of level surfaces of our curve and we draw a line between any two points in the input space, um, the property that we have again is that if we evaluate F at any point along this line, then it's gonna fall below uh, F, evaluated, uh, F, F evaluated at the boundaries of the line. Um, so we can see here, for example, for, for all these level surfaces, if I draw a line between any two points on a level surface, uh, then the function inside, or the function along those lines will be lower than, than the value of the boundaries. Um, so that was an example of a convex function. And again, sort of to, contra to contrast that, here's an example of a non-convex function. Um, and again, we can see the sort of property of the level surfaces curving in across themselves, which tells us that uh, there are lines we could draw between the level surfaces where the function is sort of curving up and then curving back down, which sort of violates the, the convexity property. Um, so there are convex functions, um, and then a, cro a closely related concept to convex functions is convex sets. Um, so the mathematical definition of that uh, sort of looks a bit similar. So what we're saying is that if we've got uh, some subset of Rn, and we've got uh, two points x0 and x1 in that set, so again, uh, the picture you should have is sort of some amorphous blob kind of in n-dimensional space, uh, is, is C here as our set, and we've got any two points in that set, then what it means for the set to be convex is that uh, this expression, which again, you can think of as any point on the line between X0 and X1, then any point on that line has to fall inside the set. Um, so this is the mathematical definition, but the plain English definition is that if we've got a convex set, then what that means is that if I have any two points in the set, then all the points on the line between the set uh, are also in that set, or all, all the points on the line between those points are also in the set. Um, and that means that you essentially have to have things like spheres or cubes or sort of polyhedra. And what you can't have is are, are surfaces or sets where the boundary of the set sort of curves in against itself or towards itself. Because then if I took two points on the boundary and drew a line between them, that line would go outside the set. Um, so from those two definitions, a bunch of kind of nice mathematical facts fall out. Um, so one is that if we have two convex sets and we take their intersection, that's also convex, and that's a, a property that we can take advantage of often in optimization. Um, if I have a convex function, then if I take an inequality against it, so if I say I have f of x and it's convex, then all the points satisfying f of x less than n for some constant n, those form a convex set. Um, and sort of a corollary of that is that if I have all the points where f of x is equal to n, those are going to form the boundary of a convex set. So one way, another way of thinking about convex functions is that they're functions where when we set them equal to some constant value, they form surfaces like spheres or like ellipsoids or like polyhedra where we know that all the points inside of them are, are smaller. 
Um, and again, that might start to give you some intuition for why convexity might be a nice property for optimization. Um, another property that we have is that uh, in two dimensions, a convex set doesn't intersect with any of its tangent lines. So if you think about, say, a circle or an oval or a, uh, an ellipse, when we draw a tangent line somewhere to the boundary of that uh, set, then that tangent line doesn't intersect anywhere with the set. Um, so the three-dimensional generalization of that is that if we have a convex set and we take a plane that's tangent to the boundary, then that plane won't interact, intersect anywhere with the set. So again, sort of the mental picture you should have are, is it like a surface, or sorry, a sphere or an ellipsoid, uh, but also something like a cube, for example, has that property. Um, and in general, the sort of n-dimensional version of this is that if we have an n-dimensional convex set, then it doesn't intersect with its supporting hyperplanes, which is sort of the n-dimensional generalization of a tangent line or a tangent plane. Um, and then finally, if your function is differentiable, which doesn't have to be to be interesting in this context, then a um, function is convex if its second derivative is not negative everywhere or the sort of n-dimensional generalization of that. Um, so why are we talking about convexity? Well, convexity is this really nice property for optimization. So <coughs> um, we can say a couple things if we know uh, convexity properties of our inputs. So if our objective function f is convex, and the feasible region that satisfies all of our constraints is a, is a convex set, um, then we're guaranteed two things. So one is that uh, local extrema of our function are also global extrema. So we don't have to have solve that sort of basin hopping problem of our, our optimization algorithm getting st stuck in local extrema. Um, and then to some extent, as a consequence of that, um, we have efficient, by which I mean polynomial time algorithms to find extrema. Um, and we can take advantage of those to do, do nice things. Um, so that's all good, um, but one of the challenges uh, with convex optimization is that most solvers expose a pretty low level interface um, where they require you to sort of take your problem and put it into some canonical form, usually specified as like a collection of matrices. Um, and you have to be very sure that you set up those matrices exactly correctly and then you have to feed them into the solver and get your result back. And if, if you did that wrong, you don't really get useful error messages um, and it can be really hard to bug, especially if you're not an expert in this sort of thing. Um, and so a relatively recent development, uh, maybe in the last sort of 15, 20 years, though there's, there's other work that's done this earlier, um, has been the development of these sort of higher level modeling languages where, that allow you to um, essentially express your problem in, in a little bit more of a higher level way that's a little bit more like what, how you'd write the problem mathematically. And then what the modeling languages do is take that high level description and translate it into that canonical form and then feed it off to a solver, have the solver solve the problem and then hand you back kind of a high level representation. And so um, a particularly popular set of tools for doing this for convex optimization is uh, CVX, which is originally a MATLAB library and then it's now got uh, cousins CVX Pi for Python and then convex.jl is a Julia library that all sort of use the same low level bindings. Um, so like I said, yeah, CDX is MATLAB library, CDX Pi for Python and convex.jl. Um, and they implement the system called disciplined convex programming. Um, and the way DCP works, or which is what discipline stands for disciplined convex programming, um, is that it allows us to sort of build these expressions out of a set of primitives, which we know have known curvature and known sign. Um, and then you sort of build up these expressions using CVX Pi, you feed it off into a solver, and then CVX Pi hands you back a solution that describes the, the solution to your problem. Um, so as an example of how that might work, I want to show a couple examples of convex optimization for portfolio construction. Um, sort of standard disclaimer about any of this, none of this is intended to give you financial advice or tell you sort of how to make trades or do anything like that. I'm just trying to show you examples of tools that you might be interested in using for something like a portfolio construction problem. Um, so here's sort of a relatively artificial scenario where I'm imagining that I have some ex belief about the expected returns of five assets. So I'm saying uh, the expected returns of these five assets are, you know, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.5. So I, I think the rightmost asset is, you know, way better than these other assets. Um, so one thing sort of naively, the simplest thing we might be interested in doing is trying to construct a portfolio that maximizes our returns. Um, maybe subject to some constraints. The way that we might express that in CVX pi is we say, okay, well, given some vector of expected returns, um, the first thing we're gonna do is build a variable that's the, the, the thing that we're trying to optimize over. So this is sort of uh, what's representing the, the optimization domain. So we're gonna say, all right, the weights are a variable of length expected return. So this is gonna generate sort of an expression representing an array of in this case, five uh, values. 
And what we're trying to do is choose, the, choose a set of portfolio weights that maximizes some objectives. So what's our, what's our objective? Well, in this case, what we're gonna say is our objective is to maximize uh, the dot product of the weights that we choose with our expected return. So the expected return of our overall portfolio is just gonna be the weighted sum of the expected returns of each individual asset. And what we want to do in this example is maximize the expected return of our overall problem or of our, of our overall portfolio. And that's what we're doing in this uh, line here. So now we've got our, our variable that we're optimizing over and we've expressed our objective in terms of that variable plus some additional data, in this case, the expected returns. Um, and then the third ingredient here is now we have to feed CVXPy a problem in terms of that objective. So we're going to say, okay, um, our objective is just this maximize. Um, and then in addition to that objective, we're gonna pass a list of constraints. So we're gonna say in this case that the sum of the absolute values of all of the weights needs to be less than or equal to one. So this is essentially imposing a leverage constraint on our portfolio where we're saying we can't allocate more than 100% of our total capital among longs or shorts in this portfolio. So now we've got our problem that's sort of a well-posed optimization problem. Um, and then the way that we actually get values back out of CVXPy here is we say, well, we call this solve method. And what solve will do is, again, take the expressions that we've built, feed them off into a low level solver that will actually solve the problem. And then it will uh, take that result back and sort of put it back into the variables that we set up before. So in this case, what's gonna happen is after the problem gets solved, uh, this weights variable that we constructed up here will now have a dot value attribute that's gonna be an array that contains the weights that, that optimize the problem. And so in this case, what we're gonna do is just grab those, round them so that they display a little nicer and flatten them out and then return them. So if I construct this, you know, think for yourself for a, sec for a second, uh, what you might think is the, uh, you know, the, the optimal portfolio given this uh, set of inputs. I'll sort of give you a second to, to ponder for yourselves what you're, what you're sort of expecting when I hit the cell. Um, so of course what happens here, right, is uh, we just put all of our money in one asset, right? So with no other beliefs about the world, if we say, well, we want to maximize our expected return, then the, the optimal thing to do there is to just put all of our money in the single asset with the highest expected return. Um, so for example, if I make the, the second most asset now have a higher expected return, then now CVXPI will put all of our money in that asset instead. Um, so this is sort of a common uh, failure or a common example, common sort of experience working with these kinds of solvers is that you set up a problem for the solver and the solver sends you back a, a solution that's, that's maybe not so great because all the solver is doing is just sort of blindly solving the optimization problem that you set out. And of course, we as rational investors often might want to think, well, we don't just want to put all of our money in a single asset. We want to diversify our portfolio across sort of a, a collection of assets. Um, but CVXPi doesn't know anything about that. We just told CVXPi to maximize our expected returns. And so it's just going to put all of our money in one asset. Um, and so, okay, so now we, we get to this point and we might ask ourselves, well, well, why is it that we might want to not just put all of our, our assets or all of our capital in a single asset? Um, and one reason why that might be the case is that uh, we're, we're not just concerned with the expected return of our portfolio, we're also concerned with the expected volatility of our portfolio. Um, and so a slightly more sophisticated uh, optimization technique might be something like this, which is a Markowitz portfolio optimization. Um, this is a uh, sort of theory that was developed in, in the 1950s and 60s for, uh, for which uh, eventually the Nobel Prize in Economics was awarded. Um, and the idea here is we're not only interested in the expected value of our portfolio, we're also interested in the expected volatility of our portfolio. And so we can build up a more sophisticated objective function that sort of expresses the fact that we're interested in both expected ret uh, returns and expected volatility. Um, and you, you can you'll see Markowitz portfolio optimization uh, phrased in a couple different ways. Sometimes you'll see it phrased as maximizing returns subject to a given uh, level of volatility or uh, minimizing risk subject to a, a given expected return. Um, in this case, uh, I'm using a slightly different formulation where I'm going to say uh, the inputs to my optimization are going to be uh, the expected returns of all the assets. So again, we still have to produce some projection of expected returns. And then I'm also going to take now a two-dimensional matrix describing the expected covariance of the assets. And that tells us sort of how, when two assets uh, values changes, how the values are expected to change together. So two assets will have high covariance or have, have positive covariance if when one asset goes up, the other one tends to go up as well. Uh, they'll have zero covariance if they sort of are independent one another and they'll have negative covariance if uh, one of the assets tends to goes up, go up and the other one tends to go down. 
Um, so those are these two terms that are now describing not just our expected return, but also maybe some measure of our expected risk. Um, and then this third parameter is a risk aversion parameter. So it's going to tell us how to sort of balance the trade-off between expected return and expected risk. Um, and so here we're again going to construct a, this weights vector, which is our optimization variable. Um, but now our objective gets a little bit more complex. So we're going to say our expected return is still this dot product. Um, but then our expected volatility is uh, this CVX dot quad form here. And what that's going to essentially compute is uh, like weights times covariance times weights dot T, but it's going to do it in a, in a slightly more efficient way. Um, and that turns out to be the, the right way for us to try to measure the expected volatility of our overall portfolio, assuming that the covariance that we fed in is correct. And talking a little bit about why we might have reason to not, or reason to be worried about that. Um, but so now we've got these two expressions, which are expected return and our expected volatility, again, expressed as these kind of CVX pi modeling expressions. Um, and then our actual utility function is going to be our expected return, right? So we want our utility function to go up uh, if our expected return increases, but we want our utility function to go down if our expected volatility increases. And we want, to go, want it to go down sort of weighted by this risk aversion parameter. So what, what this essentially says is that if risk aversion is really high, then we'll care more about the expected volatility. And if risk aversion is really low, then we'll care more about the expected return. So this is sort of our way of expressing that we want to, want to balance between expected return and expected volatility. Um, and then our objective now is going to be to maximize not just expected return, but to maximize this more complex utility function. Um, and we're going, to, we're, going to get, we're going to give this a little bit more interesting constraints. So we're now we're going to uh, force that our portfolio is fully invested. So we're going to say that the sum of the entries in our weights has to add up to one. Um, and then we're also going to provide a long only constraint. So we're going to say all of the weights in our portfolio need to be greater than or equal to one. Um, and if we take those constraints, we feed them into a problem, uh, we solve it, and then we again uh, sort of extract the values out. So now we can actually get back uh, not just the weights, but also the values of our expected return and our expected volatility, um, which are again set because we called this uh, solve method. Um, and if we do this, then we can see sort of what our portfolio looks like. So here I'm saying we've got the same set of expected returns. And now to start with, we'll just have a diagonal covariance matrix. So this is saying that we think all the assets have essentially the same volatility. Um, and we think the assets are totally independent of one another, which is certainly not the case in the real world, but we're starting with a simple example. Um, and if we do that, now we can see that CVX pi doesn't just put all of our, all, all of our money in a single asset. Um, it sort of has this gradated uh, portfolio where it says, okay, we're, we're going to put the most money in the asset with the highest expected return, uh, but we're going to put a little bit of money in the next asset and a little bit of money in the next asset and a little bit less in this one. And then we're still not going to put any money in the, the asset with almost no expected returns. So we can see that now because we've incorporated this more sophisticated view of our expected uh, variance, we naturally sort of spread out our, uh, our bets across more assets. And we can see that if we change around uh, these covariance parameters, that it will, it will change accordingly. So for example, if I say uh, this asset with very high returns also has very high volatility, then CVX pi will put less capital in that asset. So before we were putting about 40% of our portfolio in that. Um, but if I make its covariance much larger, now we're only putting about 20% in that. Um, and similarly, we might think, uh, okay, if two of our, if, you know, diversification is only useful for us uh, in the sense if the two assets that we're diversifying across sort of move independently of one another. But if we put, say, in this case, we're putting 70% of our portfolio in these top two assets. And if those assets almost always sort of gain or, or lose together, then that actually doesn't really make sense for us. We're, we're not actually getting any value. So we can express that by saying, okay, these two assets actually have uh, a non-zero covariance. So they tend to move somewhat together, which means it's not that valuable for us to put some of our capital in one of them and some of the capital in the other one. And so if I uh, update the covariance matrix and run this again, whoops, I need a zero there. Um, then we can see that now CVX pi chose to put much less of our capital in the second asset. So if we go back to zero, zero here, before we were putting about 30% of our capital in uh, the second asset, but with a higher covariance, now we're only putting about 20% of our capital. And if we put this all the way up to like, almost uh, equal to the general variance, then we can actually see that CVX pi ends up putting essentially no weight because it says these assets are, are more or less perfectly substitutable. So I'm just going to put all the capital in the asset that has the higher expected return. It's not worth it to, to diversify. Um, so this is sort of Markowitz portfolio optimization and the, your 
uh, obligatory. Uh, we have to plot the, the efficient frontier here. So the idea here is now for a given risk return trade-off, if we uh, know, if we have a, a projection of the expected return and the expected covariance, then we can see, okay, here are all the sort of rational portfolios that we might be interested in. So all the points along this curve have some level of risk and some level of return. And these are the points that for different uh, risk return trade-offs optimize our portfolio. And we can, we can get this sort of nice uh, curve where we get uh, larger expected returns as we're willing to take on more risk uh, and lower expected returns as we take on less risk. Um, so that's great. So, so that sort of takes us up to sort of the state of the art in portfolio optimization circa 1950 or so. Um, and so you might ask, well, well what's, what's, what have been the developments since then? And why, why might we not be so excited about Markowitz portfolio optimization? Um, and there's a couple reasons for that. Some of them sort of have to do with the intrinsic challenges in finance, and some of them have more to do with kind of numerical optimization problems. Um, so one problem with this, uh, this phrasing of the problem is that it requires that we actually produce an estimate of the expected returns of these assets and their expected covariance. Um, and that's a relatively hard challenge, right? If we, if we knew the expected returns of every assets, every asset with a high degree of certainty, um, that, that would be, you know, a, a very powerful achievement and we could do quite well with that. But usually we don't have a very high degree of confidence. We might, you know, have some, some belief about the expected returns of different assets, but or we might have relative beliefs where we might not know, you know, that asset A is going to do better, it's, it's going to have exactly these returns, but we might believe that asset A is going to do better than asset B, say. Um, but it's very hard for us to have sort of high confidence in our estimates of expected returns or estimates of expected covariance. Um, so that's one, one concern. And then that gets compounded by the fact that the way that this optimization works, it's very sensitive to small changes in our input. So we saw, for example, that uh, you know, here we're putting 40% of our portfolio in one of these assets, but if I make a relatively small change to this covariance matrix, then that has actually pretty dramatic effects on our overall portfolio. So we went from putting 40% of our portfolio in a single asset to only putting 20%, which would be, you know, 20% of our portfolio turning over. And so that should be particularly worrisome to us if, as I mentioned before, we often don't have a very high degree of confidence in our ability to estimate returns or covariance. So, these, these two combinations of sort of being very sensitive to small deviations in the input, um, coupled with sort of relative difficulty of making very precise predictions, uh, means that often when we use Markowitz portfolio optimization, uh, we should be worried that the portfolios that we end up choosing end up dominated by sort of simulation noise or, or by, by model fitting error, and that uh, it's relatively hard for us to choose a portfolio that actually sort of takes advantage of our beliefs about the market in this way. Um, so what, what can we do instead of that? Well, well, one thing we might try to do is uh, not necessarily try to express a view about uh, expected returns, but just try to sort of express a more general view about, say, um, you know, a, a, a set of scores for asset. We want to try to maximize the, the scores. And then we might, rather than trying to quantify our expected risk, we might just want to put some uh, historical constraint on how whatever portfolio we choose, uh, how much money we're willing to lose on the given debt. Um, and so to do that, we might do something uh, like this example, which is doing a, a CVAR optimization. So again, I'm just sort of generating some random data to go in. So we're saying uh, we're going to have our, our alpha values are sort of ranging from negative two to two, and we're going to have eight assets. Um, and then I'm going to generate some random uh, historical returns from a T distribution. Um, so here I'm saying I've got 500 uh, days worth of uh, sort of samples of returns. Um, with uh, eight assets here, and we're sort of scaling this down. And so if we look at, at what this looks like, we've got, you know, all these are centered around one, but we've got some pretty big tail events here because we're using this T distribution. So for example, at the top end, we've got, you know, the max every day for all these assets is like a 30% gain, and the min every day is like a 30 to 40% loss. So these are sort of very volatile assets, we might imagine here. Um, and so now what, what we're going to optimize here is not you know, our, our risk adjusted expected return, but we're going to say, we're just going to maximize that, that alpha parameter again. So uh, we're going to constructing our weights and our objective is just going to be that same objective that we've seen before, which is uh, maximizing the weights, uh, the weight that some of our, oops, of our objectives. Um, let me just move this up here. Um, but then what we're going to do is something a little bit more interesting with our constraints. So 
Uh, we're taking our alphas and our expected returns, and then we're going to say here is uh, what we're going to constrain is essentially how much money we're willing to lose on the work on sort of a very bad day for our portfolio. And we're going to do that based on just sort of the historical returns observation. So the two parameters that we're passing in is, is the percentile cutoff. So this is saying, you know, on our uh, fifth percentile day, so, you know, the bottom 5% uh, of our days, that, that's what this percentile is describing. Um, and then the max loss is saying, how much money are we willing to have lost historically on, uh, you know, a fifth percentile or worse day? Um, and so the way we can express that in CVXPy is we can say, all right, we've got some number of samples. Um, we can say, all right, the returns of a given portfolio on any given day are going to be given by uh, the returns times the weights. Um, and then we can say, well, what's the average worst day of an asset that falls below that percentile cutoff? And the way we can do that is using the CVX.sum smallest function. Um, and then what we're, we're going to constrain is now saying that uh, our for, for whatever portfolio we finally choose as, as a result of this optimization, um, the average of our worst days across the, the last 500 days um, has to be greater than our mass, max loss, where again, this is assigned greater than. So we're saying we can't have lost more than our, our max loss threshold on any of the, on the on average on the 5% worse, 5% or worse days. Um, so we take those constraints, again, we feed them into our CVX pie, we ask it to solve the problem, we, oops, we extract the, the values back out of this uh, out of this optimization. Then we can ask CVXPy to uh, generate a portfolio for us. So if we run this, we can see that uh, the portfolio we get uh, sort of is long on the uh, assets with the higher alphas and, and small on the assets with the lower alphas. And one of the things that's interesting here is it's actually dynamically chosen a size for us, right? So in the previous examples, we had to tell CVXPy, all right, we, we can't put more than 100% of our portfolio in any single name, or we can't put uh, or we can't put more than you know 100% of our portfolio across all the different assets, or we have to be fully invested. We have to put uh, you know 100% of our portfolio in, in any given asset, or, or, or spread out across all the different assets. I mean, here we didn't actually do that. All we all we constrained was said said that for whatever portfolio we choose, if we look at its historical day-on-day -day returns, the average return on the worst 5% of the days has to be greater than some loss. And so based on that, uh, CVX probably sort of dynamically figured out for us how much we should be allocating across those different assets. Um, and then we'll notice here that uh, if we take the average of those uh, sort of 5% worst days, which is what we're doing on this line here, um, then we do in fact see that our uh, average bad day was a 5% loss, which corresponds to the fact that uh, in the optimization, we said uh, we don't want to lose more than 5%. So for example, if I increase this up to negative 0.1, then now our average bad day moves up to negative 0.1, and we end up putting more capital on these assets accordingly. Um, so we can make this you know, very large and say, okay, we're, we're willing to lose half of our portfolio on any given day, and then we'll end up taking much larger bets. Um, so one thing that this, this might be interesting for is if you're trading a mixed asset portfolio where you know, just understanding how much capital you have allocated across different assets might not be uh, sort of the right measure of risk for you because you know, a, a given amount of capital in, say, uh, you know, U.S. Treasury bonds has a very different risk profile than a given amount of, uh, you know, capital allocated to, say, like Bitcoin. Um, those are very different volatilities. And so trying to figure out how to size, size your allocations across those different asset classes um, can be challenging just, say, using uh, sort of total exposure. Um, so to review kind of the, the concepts we just talked about, that was the, the last uh, financial example I wanted to talk about. Um, so one, uh, one takeaway I want you to have from this is that uh, Python has lots of great tools for optimization. So we talked about uh, scipy.optimize is sort of a, a general purpose, if somewhat uh, low level uh, toolkit for using all kinds of different uh, numerical solvers. And we talked a little bit about kind of its interesting interface and how you can get more information about that. Um, and then we talked a bunch about CVXPy, which is this really nice, a little bit more high level toolkit for uh, describe it for describing convex optimization problems in, in this more mathematical language. Um, and there's lots of other tools not covered. So in particular, if you're you know, a Quantopian user, you might know the, the Optimize API on Quantopian, which allows you to express not just sort of these high level matrix, out, uh, matrix equations, but actually sort of financial domain concepts of so things like uh, maximize alpha or uh, choose a target portfolio. And it allows you to express constraints like, uh, you know, uh, 
constrain my exposure relative to the quantokian risk model, say, or relative to, uh, say, different sector codes and only allocate, you know, n percent of my portfolio to different sectors. So there's lots of tools kind of on the spectrum from very low level tools like scipy.optimize to relatively high level tools, but like uh, the Optimize API and Quantopian. Um, another, another sort of takeaway I want you to have is this geometric intuition for convex functions and why convex functions are a useful property to have in optimization. Um, and again, that geometric intuition essentially is that convex functions sort of curve upward as we traverse points between lines. So when we draw the lines between our points, our functions always fall below those lines. And so what that sort of naturally means is that convex functions are these kind of bowl-shaped or upward curving functions. And that gives us this really nice property that uh, we can easily find global minima uh, just by sort of like following gradients or by doing more sophisticated mathematical techniques. Um, and then convex sets, the geometric intuition I want you to have for those is that a convex set is one where if I take any two points in the set, then that set also contains all the lines between uh, those two points. And convex sets are particularly nice or particularly important for us for uh, convex optimization because convex sets need to, uh, are what describes sort of our feasible regions. And so the constraints we can express have to correspond to these convex sets. Um, another takeaway I want you to have is that sort of convex optimization allows us to efficiently solve this wide variety or this wide array of uh, interesting problems. Um, and these high level modeling tools like CVXPy or like Quantopia Not Optimize mean that you don't necessarily need to be sort of a, a numerical programming expert in order to productively use these kinds of solvers. Um, so that's all the material that I wanted to share with you today. So if we've got uh, some questions from the chat, uh, I think we've got a few, uh, I can try to answer some. Yep, so we're gonna move on to the Q&A session. So if you have a question for Scott, you can put it into the text box on the GoToWebinar panel, um, and then we will get to as many questions as we can. Um, yeah, so, some of these are sort of coming back from earlier. So one question someone asked was, uh, what's N on, on the slide and the useful facts about convexity? So if I go back to that slide, uh, I'm actually going to uh, pop back out to the notebook view here. So I think this was asking about this slide here. Um, oops, there we go. Um, yeah, so it's asking if f is convex and the points satisfying uh, f of x form a convex set. So and the question is, what, what's n on this slide? So n is any constant. So the idea here is if, I, if I've got a convex function, then for any n that I choose, which is just a scalar value, like 5 or 10 or a billion or whatever, then, uh, then for any inequality that I can choose, uh, the set of points satisfying this inequality in this way uh, form a convex set. And again, the intuition you should have for this is that if I've got my function f, um, then these inequalities sort of correspond to like spheres or ellipsoids or sort of nice rounded uh, sets where say tangent planes don't intersect with the set or sort of more general, they sort of correspond to hyperspheres or hyper ellipsoids where supporting hyperplanes don't uh, intersect with the set. Um, another question someone asked was, uh, do quants usually use the CVXPy library? Um, so quants are sort of, Quants, at least outside of the Quantopian platform, are kind of notoriously secret about what tools they use. Um, I know that uh, the folks who work on CVXPy have used it for uh, financial applications. So I think it's at least written somewhat with uh, these tools like uh, portfolio optimization in mind. Um, I do know that in terms of recommending the library, I, I having looked through CVXPy and used it a bunch, have, have been sort of very happy with it. Um, scientific code often kind of has a reputation for being um, hard to follow or like not very well thought out or like not sort of written with software engineering best practices in mind. I'm, I've actually been very impressed with CVXPy in general. So uh, I find it a super useful tool. Um, someone else asked, uh, will you be sharing this notebook for us to play around with? So this uh, notebook is, uh, will be posted on my GitHub um, and I, we can probably figure out a way to send this out to other folks who are signed up for the webinar as well so that people can, uh, look with this. You'll have to have the software necessary to install this, so not all the tools that I'm showing here today run on the Quantopian platform, um, but you, if you've got sort of your own Python environment set up, then you can uh, use these. Um, what else do we have here? So we saw some nice examples with scipy.optimize and constrained optimization with CVXPy. Uh, scipy.optimize is also capable of constrained minimization. In what scenarios would we use one package over the other? So this is asking about um, we saw CVXPy and we saw scipy.optimize and, and 
the examples that I used with scipy.optimize were um, only doing unconstrained optimization, whereas with CVXPy, we saw that kind of an important part of using the tool as, as describing these constraints. Um, so I have mostly actually used CVXPy. Uh, scipy.optimize, in my experience, is, is a little bit uh, tricky to use if you're not kind of an expert in the algorithms because it requires you to specify this information in terms of you know the particular canonical form that the uh, algorithm to, that you're using requires but if you're comfortable using scipy.optimize and you know you know which solver that you're interested in one of the challenges there is like you need to know which solver to use and that depends a lot on uh, like what you know about your function so the solver examples that I showed were sort of totally general solvers where you don't know anything about like the gradients or the uh, the Hessian or any kind of like local curvature of the function. Um, and so in those cases, essentially all you can do is like guess and check and try to infer what the gradients might be. Um, whereas there are other solver algorithms where if you know more interesting information about the curvature, then um, we can do much better. And for example, CVXPy is using those kinds of algorithms. Um, so if you sort of know and like and are comfortable with sci optimize, I I would imagine it's still fine for that. I, I've tended to find it a little bit uh, tricky to use uh, unless I'm like really interested in a particular low level thing. Um, and as far as like when should you use particular algorithms, I would, I would look at that show options function that I showed, which kind of gives documentation about uh, what the different solvers do and why you might want to use one or the other. Um, someone asked, is this well supported in R? I am not aware of a, an R port of, of CVX, but it's all, the way sort of uh, CVX and CVXPy and uh, convex.jl work is they all sort of call into a, um, a C++ library called CVX Canon, I believe. Um, and so they all sort of share code there. So uh, I know R has sort of has some similar functionality for sort of building uh, extension interfaces in native languages. So I imagine it could be done at least in principle. I don't know a lot about the state of the uh, convex optimization um, framework or the sort of landscape in R specifically. Um, someone asked, does CVX perform any value at risk calculations? So CVX or CVX Pi by itself doesn't really know anything about um, kind of financial domain concepts. It's just this tool for sort of describing mathematical optimization problems. Um, so you can express a value at risk uh, optimization in terms of the tools that, it, that it provides, but CVXPy doesn't have any sort of native functionality to, to do value at risk, say. Um, so in order to do that, you'd want to build, build uh, kind of a higher level tool using something like the functions that I showed at the end of the notebook. Um, someone shows how to implement a worst case scenario optimization using CVX. So something like the value at risk example that I showed would work for that if you tuned those parameters so that uh, you know, you're only interested in like very end of the tail events, um, you would end up with something like that. Um, someone asked why use alpha in the CVAR opt optimization isn't using the historical returns enough. So, so that depends a little bit. So th this question is asking uh, in the CVAR example that I showed before, I'll pop back over to that. Um, let's sort of run through. Um, so yeah, so in this example, the objective was still uh, this dot product of weights times our alphas. Um, the question is asking why use that instead of the historical returns? And the answer to that is we, we still need some criterion to choose our portfolio. Um, and we need and that means we need to express some belief about the future expected returns or about some sort of future desirable properties of the assets. So you don't necessarily have to have some sort of like fancy factor model and take an alpha from that. You might, like one, one term you might pass here is just sort of, uh, you know, historical average return, just something like that. Or you might have some other function that you're interested in optimizing that you think is a desirable feature of an asset in your portfolio. So you might, you know, be like minimizing, uh, your, your alpha might be sort of like inverse risk or something like that. But in general, what we need to pass here is some, some function for CVXPy to maximize subject to the CVAR constraint. Um, hopefully that answers that question. Um, How different, someone asked, how different is CVX opt from CVX pi? So CVX opt um, is one of these low level solvers and it, it, it implements a particular uh, solver algorithm for, um, it's sort of, CVX opt is sort of more akin to like scipy.optimize than it is to CVX pi. Um, 
CVX Opt is actually one of the solvers that CVX Pi can defer to. So again, the way that CVX Pi works is it provides these sort of expression language where you can sort of create variables um, and sort of write these functions like some smallest or maximize or there's like T and dot product here. Um, and that sort of all just describes kind of an abstract way the equations defining the problem that you're interested in solving. And then what CVX Pi actually does when you tell it to solve something is it takes those equations and translates them, them into a canonical form and hands them off to some other solver. So CVX Opt is one of those other solvers that CVX Pi can defer to, but it supports other ones. So it supports uh, ECOS and SCS and Mosic, and there's like some proprietary solver. Mosic is one of the proprietary solvers. Um, so you can sort of choose these different backends, and different backends might be better for certain kinds of problems or others. Um, someone asked, how many constraints does Quantopian's Optimize API use on average? So that's a little bit of a tricky question to answer. So, so the way Quantopian's Optimize API works is that we take these sort of high-level constructs like uh, maximize alpha or like um, you know, constrained sector exposure, and we essentially translate those into CVX Pi expressions, feed them off to CVX Pi to be executed, and then take the results back and, and sort of translate them back into the domain. Um, so it depends a fair amount on which particular constraint you're interested in. So like we have like a pair constraint that I think do sugars into three different constraints, whereas like the factor exposure constraint only de sugars into two, but that's not really the right metric for like understanding the complexity there because the factor exposure constraint is like a constraint on a big matrix multiplication, whereas the pair constraint is like a constraint on the ratio of two scalar values. So the number of logical CVX pi constraints doesn't necessarily correspond in a meaningful way to you know, the, the magnitude of the optimization or how complex it goes. Um, someone asked, can you quickly show that Markowitz optimization and score optimization are convex problems? Um, I can, the fact that CVX pi accepts those and, and will run this is sort of one example of that. Uh, and if you're asking for like a mathematical proof of that fact, I, I probably can't do that quickly. <laughs> um, but I think sort of the general intuition there is that um, our objective function is either a dot product, which is a linear function. So that, so linear functions are convex. And then the other term in that optimization is the, that quad form, which is multiplication of, a, of an array in, of matrix times array, or sorry, vector times matrix where that matrix has to be positive semi-definite um, times another matrix. And that turns out to be convex for reasons that are harder for me to explain right now than we can get to um, here. Um, and I think I'm getting the signal that we are just about out of time. So if you've got further questions, you can I think email, what, I don't know. Yeah, what. you can email events at quantopian.com and um, we'll pass those on to Scott and try to get an answer to you. So the notebook is available, like Scott said, on his GitHub. And um, I think that was on the title page of the webinar slides. And thank you all for joining. And thanks, Scott, for a great presentation. Thank you all for tuning in.